Good morning, I'm Adam Sexton. New Hampshire's 2020 first in the nation primary went so well from a logistical standpoint last week that everyone from the Secretary of State on down to the city and town clerks got a shout out from the governor and a stand to go from the legislature at the State of the State address. Three candidates had something to celebrate last week, a few dropped out and some are now on the ropes, but there is still a long way to go in this primary process and here to help us talk it out, look backwards and forwards are Karen Hicks and Michael Biundo, two of the top political minds here in the state. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. So let's start with you, Karen. Uh, before we get to the race itself, uh, right now, looking forward, the Democrats appear to be set to head into kind of a delegate war of attrition right now. What's going to happen next? Well, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is we're really early in the process. Uh, just over 1% of the total delegates have been awarded in these first two contests. Even after Nevada and South Carolina, it'll be 3%. And so March is really going to be critical as the campaigns break out. We have Super Tuesday and the following Tuesday are big delegate caches that'll be up for grabs. Mm -hmm. So I think we will know a lot about who the likely nominee is towards the end of March, but I think it's going to be a real race to get there. Mm -hmm. And Mike, uh, you've advised, uh, I think, what was it, three candidates in 2016. So you had a real perspective on that race well from a lot of different yeah. uh, you know, aspects of that race, though. Do you see any similarity between Donald Trump then and Bernie Sanders now in terms of the establishment being like, there's yeah. no way this guy can win, and yet he might keep building? I do. Um, you know, I was talking about it with uh, some of my colleagues just the other day. You know, I, I think one of the things that Bernie has that, that Donald Trump had in 2016, I think still has now, is energy behind his, his campaign. Uh, you cannot deny that Bernie Sanders can fill a room. Um, Donald Trump is very good at filling arenas. And I think that type of energy is something for on the Republican side we have to be cautious of and we have to look at and say, you know what, you know, something's happening there. There is a different type of campaign than what we're used to going up against on the Republican side. Karen, what do you think there? Obviously, Sanders has that chunk of support, but is there a hard ceiling there? Well, I think we'll find out soon. And so he clearly has very committed supporters that did not leave him in this. And in a very large field, you know, he's got a lock on about a third of the electorate and they're committed. And so part of the dynamics in the race is that Elizabeth Warren peeled off. He, he underperformed, obviously, from where he was last time. He was about half of his support in the state of New Hampshire, uh, but he kept that support and they didn't go anywhere. Elizabeth Warren peeled off a lot and then recommitted to contesting that kind of progressive lane in the primary, and I think she saw the limitations of that as well. And I think as the contest is, is more wide open and we get outside these early states, Bloomberg is going to be a factor in that, and we will potentially see some consolidation of the moderate candidates as some of them just decide to bow out because either their cash runs out or they they think this is the fight of their life and they're gonna make a sacrifice for the greater good I think I, I think to Karen's point too um, you know in January, I think January 30th is when South Carolina started taking early votes to have early vote in, in person. So, you know, Joe Biden has an organization d down there. I would not count Joe Biden out yet. I think, you know, there he has trouble coming out of here. But if you remember in, in uh, 2012, Newt Gingrich came in fifth here and he won South Carolina. Now, I know it was a neighboring state of Georgia is where Newt Gingrich is from, but still that breathed new life into his campaign and kept him around much longer than when we would have wanted to on the Santorum campaign. Speaking of Joe Biden, a lot of uh, political folks, especially on the strategist side, were just pulling their hair out, seeing what happened there on Election Day in terms of him announcing he would leave the state early in the day. What were your thoughts on that, Karen? Well, I, I think a lot of people were frustrated with his effort here. He started out conceding right after Iowa. He basically said, I'm going to lose New Hampshire. And so I think if you have been working and knocking on doors for him, that is really dispiriting to see. And then when he left the state, I think it continued the frustration. The reality with Biden is that he has served the party for many, many years. But I think in this kind of contest where people are so fired up about taking down Trump, um, he hasn't run the kind of campaign that um, a lot of people think it's going to take to take down this incumbent president. So I think there's a lot of disappointment. He's never been a particularly strong campaigner. He's been prone to gaffes. And people watching him who had expectations that he was going to really come in and consolidate the field, I think, were disappointed. Um, the campaign waffled between letting Joe be Joe and trying to run a more scripted effort and kind of did both. And that left a lot of people scratching their head. It's amazing to see that even over time, from 1987 to 2020, it's rare to see a candidate run a different race. They just are who they are, and that's what happens, essentially. But, Mike, what did you think when you saw him leave? You know, 
What was Joe Biden's message? I mean, I think more importantly than him pulling out that day, which I think was a, a major mistake, I don't think he had a message. I mean, other than I'm the guy who can win, but then you don't prove it by you know losing the first two states. Where do you go from here? Because you know, in the end, he tried to change up his messaging. I saw he went out on TV, brought the Obama in, and he actually had a little bit more of a cohesive message. But up until that point, there was no message whatsoever other than vote for me because I can beat Donald Trump. And you know that doesn't win when there's energy around other people's ideas as well, and you're not actually winning the states. Let's talk about a candidate you mentioned already who didn't even compete here in the primary, but did manage to get some write-in votes, and that's Michael Bloomberg. He's moved into the state. It's almost like uh, Kramer on Jerry Seinfeld opens the door and says, here I am. Hey, what's going to happen with this? Well, I think that he has uh, come in with his formidable resource bank, and he is nervous about, like many of us are, about what happens if Donald Trump actually wins a second term. And so I think there's a lot of people who look at this field who are nervous about how uh, dispersed it is, how long the contest is, is going to go on. Um, he's concerned about the country and is willing to spend, and I think that makes this unprecedented. And so it's obviously very hard for him, having been a Republican and an independent to come into the Democratic Party. He's making a play that we've seen some people make half-hearted efforts before, but there's a couple of things that I think are different. One is that he is going to spend what it takes, and he's already started spending what it takes in these states. We've never seen that, even when you think about um, other contests, Steve Forbes coming in, uh, Donald Trump coming in, Michael Bloomberg is really um, opening up the doors and will do what it takes to be competitive in, in the uh, race. The other thing that he's doing is running a campaign that's going to, if he's not the ultimate nominee, the campaign that he's running is going to benefit the ultimate nominee because of how he's taking it to Trump and, and really, I think, running very smart set of political advertisements that are going to benefit the whole field. Mike, what do you think is a Republican strategist, are you worried about the impact Bloomberg could have, maybe not for himself, but even to, for other races in the state where he's going to start sharing, as, as Karen called it, this bank of money? I think you'd be silly not to worry about that much money coming into a, any sort of uh, campaign. That being said, you know, I think Bloomberg has an authenticity problem. And I think because, as you said, he was a Republican, he was an independent, there's really no, you know, who he is. And I think also on the Democrat side, I can't see him winning the nomination because I can't see them voting for a billionaire. Like, it, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that that is going to end up being the ultimate nominee of your party. Right, but what, what has happened over the last couple of years is people like us can't predict anything, it turns out. And and we none <laughs> of us have a crystal point. ball, and we're in a time of unbelievable disruption in our political system. And so I think we should all concede that to begin with. And on the Democratic side, people's desire desire to beat Donald Trump is, is really squeezing everything else out. If people have a pet issue, they're putting that aside. Side. If they have a pet candidate, most the most encouraging thing that I saw out of the exit polls and in my conversations with Democrats is that th they want to beat him. And so they're willing to put aside everything else. And so I think that that opens up the space for a candidate like Michael Bloomberg, if he can make the case convincingly, and he'll have the chance to. Yeah, you think about the, just even the, the old concept of sectionalism in the United States, if it's going to be three guys from New York, Donald Trump, Michael Bloomberg, and Bernie Sanders, at the end of all of this, it's going to be kind of bizarre. But another thing that's changed is endorsements. Do we need to rethink that whole thing here now? So much of the establishment came in for Hillary uh, four years ago. That didn't work here. Same with Trump. Um, and now this time around, uh, everybody went for Booker and he dropped out. Um, and I guess, do you change anything now moving forward with campaigns with endorsements? Well, I look at it this way. I think it's always been part part of the game, I don't think it is the game, uh, especially in New Hampshire. I mean, people here make up their own minds. They don't need to be told by, you know, a congressman or a state senator on who to vote for. They actually go out and do the hard work. It's what I love about the first in the nation primary is, you know, they're going and seeing people three, four times before they finally make their decision. And endorsement's not going to make it make as much of a difference here as it would in someplace else. That being said, I think it's still part of it. You know, it, the money's part of it. The grassroots is part of it. It's part of a complete campaign. And if you don't run a complete campaign, when you have good contenders up against, you lose. I think that's right. I think that um, for those of us who have worked on campaigns, you know that an endorsement gives you one vote, maybe, if, if, you, if you do the proper care and feeding of that person. And so it is part of what we evaluate how campaigns are doing before the votes are cast. And so 
uh, looking at fundraising totals, looking at those endorsements, because that's where the first competition is. Those candidates are working the phone, trying to get school board members and members of the Senate and members of the State House. And so it's one thing we shouldn't read too much into it, and I still think it's going to be part of the process. Yeah. Uh, as we wrap up here, uh, is the first in the nation primary in danger, Karen? As it always is. Hmm. We Every time uh, the circus leaves town, we have a lot of hand-wringing, bedwetting about whether or not this is the last time. It's always under threat. We have to continue to do our work to earn it, both in terms of the um, intelligence and the engagement of our voters. We saw record turnout in this election, which I think is really excellent, especially coming off of the um, messy outcome in Iowa. But uh, the members of the DNC and the RNC are going to have to do their work. Bill Gardner or the uh, um, Secretary of State going forward is going to have to do their work, and we're going to have to mix it up with the other states who are encroaching either through early voting or the people who are making the case that we need a different set of states. Like to you go got first. about 30 seconds. Yeah, here. no, I, I agree with what Karen said. I would also say, you know, Donald Trump got 120,000 votes here. Republicans came out and voted. Um, they were energized and they, and they were excited. And that's because they not only just because Donald Trump is a someone that brings energy into it, but the first in nation primary is something that they really believe in. And I think, you know, the big winners here was our state. Um, the reporters like you and WMUR did all a lot of hard work here. Um, we all should take credit in what, what happened in the first in nation primary, and hopefully it stays for another 100 years. All right. Michael Biundo, Karen Hicks, thank you for your insight this morning. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.